assuming Mark is answering well. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure being here. Uh, I don't know if again, I really just spoke 50 times. <laughs> Each one is different. So I try to change it because it becomes mechanical. So uh, again, thank you for having me. I realize I only have one out. So in terms of the questions, so let's do the following. Let me give like a five, 10 minutes introduction on the main things on what I'm going to talk about. Then uh, feel free to ask the other questions. I'm an economist, so we are very rough on people, so please feel free. Uh, if I don't know the answer, I can comfortable enough saying I don't know the answer. And then uh, I think I have lunch out after one o'clock, but I'm happy to stay as long as necessary for, for questions. So this is the WDI. Now, for those of you who don't know, actually, by the way, I'm caffeinated enough that I can speak very fast, <laughs> uh, also to make the best of the time I have. So the WDI is the flagship publication of the World Bank. It's on a different topic every year. The chief economist uh, has ideas, comes up with the president and the board, they decide on something, and it's a different team uh, on a different topic every year. So last year, it was on, on migration and refugees, and they put a team together and the unique thing about the WDI, it is not a literature survey. It is on a specifically challenging topic where there is a lot of debate and unknowns and actually arguments, right? To basically guide the thinking. Uh, it has it examples and tries to give guidance. And it is a challenging thing because it has multiple audiences. So the, the main audience are the policymakers around the world to so tell them. Look, this is the, the thinking, this is where we are, and it's based on academic fundamental research, so this is how you should be thinking about it. In a sense, and this is slightly like not just trying to teach people how to fish rather than doing that. Right? The second audience are actually, believe it or not, our internal bank colleagues, uh, trying to tell them, look, this is an important issue where you need to be designing development projects. And the third audience are actually the academics, highlighting where the knowledge gaps are. Not the knowledge gaps in terms of where you can publish, but the knowledge gaps that matter in terms of development outcomes. Okay? Now, there are a couple important things about the WDI. Uh, so the first thing, by the way, uh, I'm gonna the, the WDI, the way it works is a big team works over 16, 18 months. Uh, one of the most important things about the WDI is a 200 page document, but there are almost 120 pages of reference. It's like the heck out of everything. Right? So you we literally read hundreds of papers. Every number, every claim, everything we cite, uh, we say is cited. Uh, so I'm trying so you do those papers, you write the 20 pages, then you do the overview, it's like 25 pages. Then you have the press release for like two, three pages. Then you have the PowerPoint presentation, then you have the tweets. <laughs> right? It all boils down all that work of Dozens of people boils down to three, four sentences, which is shameful. So what you're going to get is the presentation slide to begin on three. But the impressive thing is, we, we, it's a, if you please go to the website because my annual evaluation is coming. <laughs> <laughs> One of the metrics I get is finally time to the year is is downloaded. So it is, uh, it's very you Google the year from it comes up. So. Uh, I highly recommend it, but it's a we put a big team together on uh, from the World Bank uh, and outside. Uh, the, the acknowledgement is six pages long, right? And you talk to dozens of people outside, especially civil society. We have two, uh, three advisory boards. One of them is the whole external advisory board, the heads of the UNCR, IOM, ILO, you name it. Whole bunch of politicians, they both my understanding and exceeding countries, high level politicians. Uh, the second one is academic advisory board. It is what's on it. And you know, anybody who's beginning on migration from Rana Branitsky to uh, Mushrik Nibari to Giovanni Perry, whoever was on it. And then there is a, also an internal advisory But other than that, we travel the world while we're writing it. At each step, there's multiple uh, presentations to the board. There's a reason why nobody does the video once. Right? I mean, it just it, it seems to be important. And the way it works, every WDI has a frame. Right? Again, as I say, it's not a literature survey. There's a framework on how you should be approaching it. So what I'm going to do 
as you see, I'm speaking very fast. I'm going to go over the framework quickly, and then I'm going to talk about, especially uh, the demographic component is a big part of the media. I'm going to speak about the audience. I'm going to talk about the demographic components, what we're saying, and then end with the policy. Uh, any questions? Okay. So, what I've said so far, that's all there is. Now, the way we approach the WDL, the framework is the following. So, the first dimension, and we're very kind, we like to use, especially three dimensional. Initial version was three dimensional, but it got too confusing. <laughs> that was one dimension, so it's now two dimensions. What we call the, the match. And the match is basically from the destination country perspective. How well does a migrant match in the destination country? And the match has multiple dimensions. Right? The, the most important component of the match is your human capital. The vast majority of the migrants in the world are economic migrants. How well you are matched? I am, I have, uh, I don't speak many languages, I'm really bad at it. I've been in the US 35 years, and even my English 35 years is still problematic. But so I would be a better match in the US, probably a worse match in Germany, and a horrible match in Japan. Right? <laughs> so human capital is one dimension, but there are other dimensions. Right, the, 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 especially the costs you impose on the, the destination country. There are economic costs. Right, there might be some congestion externalities in terms of public goods, in terms of education and healthcare. All of these things, and uh, maybe even the, 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 the destination country, the destination community. There are social dimensions that they don't like foreigners. Right, they, in their minds, maybe not a real economic cost, but there might be psychological or social. So the way we say, so the match, and there are this line, sorry, at the basic is the line. Along this dimension, the lower you are, your elite match, the higher you are, you are the match, right? So that's the match. The most important thing in this framework, but I'm going to tell you that where you are is endogenous. It depends on three things where you are placed in terms of. One is, of course, you, right? Your human capital was the components. The second is the destination you go. But the third one are the policies of the destination. How, whom they are, and under what conditions. And those are the rights. The most important, the, where the, the WDR push the World Bank agenda in turn is the emphasis on the rights. I mean, for good or bad, the World Bank is full of economists. And for a variety of reasons, we don't want to talk about rights. Human rights, this rights, that rights, we call them as it goes out because they're going to offend the, the, host, uh, the governments we deal with. But the, the fundamental thing about the legal rights and the rights given to the migrants, I'm not talking about necessarily citizenship, but the extent of the rights, right? It depends where you are because you can take the same guy, same country, extent of the rights determines where he is, but the rights he is given also determines, for example, if you have possible. Permanency at the destination, you will invest in local social and human capital. Right? So this this line where you are positive match or a not, not match is, is endogenous. It's policy driven. Right? Now the second one is why you might. Okay, so this is kind of, kind of from the origin country perspective. And here it is not about the economics, okay, but we're talking about if you are here at this end, you are here for your life. Right? It, I mean, large number of people pack their bags and overnight they sleep because you don't know who's going to be knocking on the door in the middle of the night. And, it, and somewhere, you know, this is a, it can be a mixed bag. There are people, uh, I came to the US in the late 80s. You know, Turkey, I'm Turkish. It was a military government. Main motivation was education, but partly my parents were like, well, you never know what's going to happen. Right? So it goes here. And then to the other extreme, you have people who are coming, you know, they have no fear at home. They're perfectly safe, all that stuff. They're perfectly, they're coming for economic opportunities. Now, this line is fundamental. It's also policy driven. The way we define it is, is if you are on this, and this is kind of defined by both domestic destination country policies, but also by uh, international norms. If you are here and you manage to come to a country, 
your best attention country cannot work on your back. It is a legal obligation to keep you. Right? If it is determined, you have you're given the refugee status. This is fundamental. Can't you know the, the, the Hungarian government or some governments deny it, but pretty much every country on the planet signed an agreement. You're a refugee, we can't send you back. Right? This is a refugee convention. All right. Now, of course, we are economists with that together. What it is this whole thing, the framework creates heterogeneity. That's what we're going to get at. You talk to policymakers that all migrants are the same, but that's not true. And this, of course, it gives you four quadrants, but it is more of a continuum, right? Everybody is somewhere in this quadrant. And where you are, as I said, depends on multiple things. But the most important thing is that what we, of course, can change, have impact on, is the policies of this thing. The whole goal of the WDR, or the whole goal of this policy regime, should be is making sure everybody is in that corner. Right? If everybody's in accord, the ascension country mm -hmm. gains, the migrant gains, and hopefully the world will come. Right? That's the, the thing. We want people to migrate, not out of necessity, but out of choice. And we want to get the destination country to benefit so they all welcome people with open arms and give them the new strengths. That's what it is. So the vast majority of the migrants are here of the on on the Indian. They're economic migrants, they actually have positive impact. That doesn't mean they benefit everybody, but all world impact in the destination of the father, they are much. And they move other people, but you know, most of us in this room are from the industry. Right? Then with Albert Einstein. He moved out of desperation to save his life, but he provided a positive net gain, presumably for the rich. This is these are the refugees. Okay, whether you like it or not. Refugees impose a cost on the host. Okay. The cost changes as well in terms of the distribution of benefits and uses. Most of the time, if you have a refugee camp and the border communities are in fact very or if you have a medical migrant or low stability working. But this, these are the refugees because a large share of the refugees are children or elderly, no legal market match outcome, right? Okay. The one thing the WDI is saying. There's a large number of people, what we are calling distressed migrants. Right? These are the guys at the boat. These are the guys trying to cross the Rio Grande. These are the guys on the boat trying to cross the Mediterranean. They are coming out of desperation, but they do not qualify for asylum. These are the guys, they're not many in numbers, but they're the guys who die while they're trying to cross an ocean. They are the ones that dominate. The, the, the newspapers and they dominate the public agenda. And what I'm going to present to you, these are the guys which actually will shape going forward. And these are the guys you want to address. Because what the, the danger this group presents, poses, is actually undermine the legal entry that happens for these guys and for themselves. Okay, so now let me go through. Key messages, heterogeneity, right? My groups are the same. Uh, in, and then the, the, the motivation, because the more rights you have, again, it's endogenous, you invest in human capital, this is fundamental. And also the, the endogeneity when it comes to policy. Right? It's everything that is, so it is policy uh, determined where the migrants are. Okay. Now, the basic building blocks. Any, any questions so far? It's not. Too complicated, I hope. Uh, okay. Right? Now, first thing, we had a big debate while we were doing this. It was how do you define a migrant? Believe it or not, it's not a straightforward thing. And I'm guilty of part of this uh, because I work with OECD consultants and maybe some of you guys do with bilateral migration agencies. Because global migration is defined based on place of birth. And WDR says no. We should define it based on citizenship. If you define it based on place of birth, it's around 270 million miles, right? More or less. But what we're saying, we're going to define it by citizenship because that's what matters in terms of rights. Okay? If you're a citizen, you have full set of rights. By definition, you're there. And it's an important point because I'm going to show it. 
Now, if you if you look at it by its absence of citizenship, uh, around forty percent of the migrants are hungry for me. You know, this is an approximate number because countries don't actually report this. A lot of it is estimated. We have to make some heroic assumptions. By the way, all of these the, the background is uh, around forty percent are in high income countries, around forty three percent low income countries, and seventeen percent live in the Persian Gulf. We separate the Persian Gulf from Turkey because the migrants here have a path to citizenship, whereas here we do not. Okay, that's fine. Too. Now, how the refugees and the refugees, they are around 20% of the 184 million refugees. This has been a sudden jump, mainly because of Ukraine in recent years. A quarter of them are in the high income countries in the West, three quarters are in low and middle income countries, which basically means one third of all migrants in the middle and in the low income countries are refugees. Whereas in the high income countries, it is one in eight. But this hides some because a lot of the refugees, people who come on a refugee visa to high income countries, eventually become, a, become nationalized. Whereas it's much lower than they should be. Right? The number of people with refugee, initial refugee status is much higher. Right? So what the, the, the citizenship is kind of flow data, whereas place of growth is a stock data. Okay? Another way of looking at it, foreign born foreign citizen, you see the difference, right? Because almost half of the people in high income countries are naturalized. The ratio changes by origin country. It's much higher in Canada and Australia, much lower in Italy and Spain. But on average, in OECD countries, it's 50%. Now, everybody, you know, you talk to some of the OECD politicians, migration is horrible. But the US passport or the French passport or the Japanese passport are among the most valuable things on this planet. Right. Why are we giving up to millions of people if migration is horrible? This is the 50 percent 50 naturalization rate is a metric of the success of migration. Right? Because nobody is forcing you to give citizenship, you're giving it voluntarily. And this is 50 percent of the foreign born. It's not like my children who are born in the US, they are born and give their citizens at birth. These are people who are naturalized. DC is obviously zero. And it is much lower in low income countries. And in the world, it's around almost one third. Okay, this is fundamental because the reason why we're saying this is all about the rights. Now, legal status <coughs> and rights, it determines freedom. This was a, by the way, big deal in the bank. Right? There are tons of people, uh, very powerful vice presidents who did not like the, this whole approach of talking about that. And to be identified, this is far less than perfect. By the way, of the people who are not citizens in a high income, they will eventually become citizens. They just haven't been in the US or in France long. Right? Eventually, almost three quarters of the people who go to a high income country become nationalists. Okay? That ratio is over 90% of the people and it depends on the world. Now, so that's number one, right? Because the importance of rights. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about, what does it mean? The whole thing implies is keep in your mind the word inflection. What do I mind the inflection point? The vast majority of migration, people respond to welfare gaps. The best metric of this is, is the income level. This is the uh, human development index, and it's very similar to actually immigrant ratio as a share of the population. Right. People go to Australia, North America, West Europe, and the Gulf, because that's where the money is. Okay. But below that, there are a couple of things. One is the demography. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to be extremely careful with that. With what I say here is the demographies. So this is West Europe. Everybody knows that, right? We know what the age I mean, Even the Europeans themselves who don't want to fight this. Okay, there's not. This is Nigeria, but it's represented in low income countries. I personally think UN population division has a problem with uh, adjustment of fertility behavior. Uh, one of my colleagues said we don't uh, assume or they assume women don't have power, that they can decide on fertility because it's a very mechanical thing. But even there, we know this is the, the pattern. 
You guys probably know it, but trust me, the rest of the world does not. Is what is happening in the middle of the That is fundamental, and that's what's going to shape the world as you know. This is not just about my vision. Right? The next WBR is on middle income track, and part of the 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 the, the, the forces that is actually pushing a lot of countries into this middle income track is the system of government. That is rapid decline in The world has not seen anything like that before. So, uh, this is the, the US growth of the year. Not from the internet. There's all parts of this small pickup because of world wars. This is the my smoothing function. <laughs> <laughs> but if you see, it's a pretty nice line, right? <laughs> Six. <laughs> you know, sorry. Basically, around 180 years. Right? And in the meantime, income, real income per capita in the US went up maybe 20 times, 30 times, depending on how you measure. This is the case in pretty much all of West, Western Europe. Now, this is for total behavior in the middle income countries. Look at India. India is yellow line. It went from six to in May, yeah. it is extremely rapid decline. Again, the world has not seen it. There are multiple reasons for it. It's urbanization, it's improvement of healthcare, it's internet, everybody has Facebook, right? Whatever forces there are, it is attacked. And uh, no, I don't have it. I, ha I have the 1990 projection of the UN population division, which are way off. <laughs> right? They are still further debate in India in 2020, so they are 8.5. Right? And that's nobody was expecting this. This implies this happens specifically. So you, you're seeing the dependency ratios, what it means for high income, middle income, and low income countries, that will start in basically 2040. The dependency ratio is going to start going up. This is part of the middle income track. And the vast majority of the world population lives in middle income countries. Okay, this is India, this is China. I mean, China's part probably can argue is forced decline in fertile rate. It's not facing India, it's not facing Turkey, it's not facing Bangladesh, Indonesia, Mexico, Tunisia, South Africa. It is linked to women's education, it's linked to economic development, it's linked to urbanization, various things. But what does it mean when you take the whole world as a whole? This is where we are. It's fantastic. We are actually in a never seen era of stability in terms of dependency ratio for pretty much 30, 40 years. We're smack in the middle. Okay. The problem is, oops, the people that's, you know, the, the stable uh, dependency ratio, the young people are in places where you don't want that. Where there are no jobs, and they're not in places where there are jobs and there's demand for them, but they're not necessarily one of the people who Okay, so ideally, if you're a central planner, like some of us are as economists, we sit in our room and we say, Oh, let's take this one from there. I could take people from uh, Nigeria and put them in Italy, and the, all of the world's problems will be solved. Unfortunately, not so, because I'm gonna get it. Right? Now, the second force is conflict and violence. <laughs> the nature the issue with conflict and violence, it's actually they don't know. They ran it. The last big three conflicts that led to big refugee flows Syria, Venezuela, and Ukraine. They are middle income countries. Okay? This was the perception it's a low income country problem, it's far away from us, it's somewhere in Africa or somewhere, it's not true, it's right down next door. Okay, we don't know where the next one is going to happen. Now, the final one I'm going to emphasize is climate change. Now, climate change, demography, we know everything. Because everyone who's going to be around in the labor market in 2050 is born today. Right? We have a pretty good idea of the labor market size in every country, even their human capital is pretty good. Conflict and violence, it's uncertain. <laughs> we know what's going to happen. Climate change, we have no clue. Not because we have no clue about climate change, we have no clue about the impact on mobility. Because the existing analysis so far on climate change is that it's first, 
vast majority of them, you know, they're unfortunately timeless and we have past data, but that's not what's happening with climate change. You can have an inflection point, right? Remember, I said inflection points. The first inflection point is demography, the rapid change in, in middle income countries. The second inflection point is we cannot keep global global warming up below a certain level. We have no idea what's going to happen because climate change, the way it impacts rich countries, it, there's an intensive margin impact, right? The intensity of the impact change, but there's also the extensive margin, the region <coughs> impacts. So far, Pretty much, we have managed to handle it internally. A lot, it operates through the decline in agricultural income, so people move to rural areas, from rural to urban areas. It kind of takes care, right? But we have no idea what's going to happen afterwards. We really do not know. It's a completely an unknown new, new, new game in town. And that's the, the, the uncertainty about the exposure moments. There are all these studies which say, oh, they're going to be 500 million environmental impacts. I think part of it is advocacy by environmental groups to scare the high income country governments because they're so worried about refugee inflows, so cut down their emissions so you don't want refugees. I think it comes both the refugee agenda and the climate agenda because it's, it's really, it's very hard to come up with an exact number. There are some simulations done by economists, and the current climate change analysis also ignores. Uh, behavioral responses in terms of productivity improvements or uh, human capital. Right? So, but anyway, this is now the most important map in the WPI. Okay, really, well, everything I say and the motivation <laughs> for why people move. It's uh, this is poverty heat map. This is fertility rates. It's fragility, conflict and violence, and this is climate vulnerability. Okay? It's all the same map. Okay? It's basically all about low income countries in sub Saharan Africa. These four problems, what this, this map is saying, these maps are saying, they are linked. Okay? They reinforce each other, probably, and they lead to what we call. The desperate migration. Okay, so far, if you look at <laughs> since the Second World War, the share of the foreign-born population or the foreign citizen for uh, share of foreign citizens has been extremely stable, right between two and four percent. It hasn't grown like the rate of international trade or FDI flows or tourism or other metrics of migration, right? But the average migrant is me. It's a middle-income guy from a middle-income country going to a high-income country. The reason that middle income countries, whether it's Mexico, India, Turkey, different that, they have decent education systems. Right? Even the guys who come to do most of their jobs, they are literate, they are likely to speak a foreign language or the capacity to learn a foreign language. Right? So you bring a construction worker, he can operate machinery. But what is happening in the world, especially because of the demographic trends, the demand is going to increase in high income countries. Italy is going to be an open air museum by 2100. Right? The population, the projection population is that Italy, the population will decline by 50% by 2100. Korea, 65% of the population will be over age 65 by 2065. Right? The demand is increasing for labor. The push is going to increase as well because now the middle income countries, Turkey used to be a migrant sending country, it's a migrant receiving country, I and mean, they're refugees, they're poor countries, but there are now more migrants in Turkey than Turks outside. Right? These countries are going to become migrant receiving, so the only source is Sub Saharan Africa, but then the human capital gap is growing. So remember that <coughs> matrix I had? People are moving down, they are moving from one corner to the other. They're from voluntary economic migrants to they become desperate migrants. And because if it is the case when vulnerability or population dynamics are forcing state vulnerability, they're either becoming what we call the desperate migrants or they're becoming refugees. That's the inflection point where you have around 20 years, 30 years to change things. Okay? That's where we are. 
So we have a new president at the World Bank. I haven't met him yet, but if you were to ask me what the WDA is about, it's about this matter. Mobility is a symptom, is an outcome of these underlying forces. I mean, there's always endogeneity, mobility impacts poverty, impacts fertility, impacts climate change, but at the end, the forces, the underlying forces are so big, they actually determine mobility. But what matters is what kind of mobility we have. And it all then boils down to fixing, it actually boils down to improving human capital so that people are becoming better matches and ready. So that's what the WDS is about. That's all there is. Okay? The, the underlying forces, mm -hmm. especially that there are, sorry, there are no more Mexicans coming to the US, there are no more Turks or Tunisians coming to Europe. And there are not going to be that many Indonesians or Filipinos going to, to high income countries. I mean, even Japan and Korea were to open their borders and realize, oh man, we made a huge mistake. We should have taken at least the Filipino nannies. It's too late. Right? There are not that many people anymore in middle income countries who will want to Yeah, here, but that's a good thing. Right? Because once you fix the unit up, you have to fix all the other problems. All right. Now, all interlinked, I said. Now, a couple of quick things, because at the end of the day, it's a whole development report. A couple of other things we identified. Most of you must have seen the, the migration hub. Turns out we don't really need it. Okay, this is the famous migration hub. So as the GDP capita goes up, migration rate goes up and then it comes down. So the French or the Italians or the Americans will say, oh, you know, if he, the, if he, you know, if you help these countries to vote, more people are going to come. Yes, two things, two caveats. One is that is dominated by small countries, not the large countries. Okay? The, the large countries, this is just a 50% of population, they are 98% of the world population or something like that. Right? It's a small country that moment. But the other thing is, as the income level goes up, yes, migration goes up, but also the composition of the migrants. You're getting because the education level goes up. Right? You're getting better skilled, better match. So that's not such a bad thing. Okay? As the income level goes up in an origin country, more educated people migrate to further distances in a larger number of destinations. The brain drain, we have a whole section, it's important. <laughs> Pretty much every, uh, this is the immigration rate, every country, migrants are positive. Whether they're, I mean, the, the, the second largest brain drain country in the world is actually the UK. Okay, they are way better educated than the natives. First, because they can afford to migrate, second, there's more demand. Because the policies are biased towards the high city. And the final thing, North countries, <laughs> is it's actually, even in a country like this, it's very diverse. It's very non homogeneous where people can keep that in mind. So when we're doing the analysis, we have to do that. Now, another important point to emphasize in the WDR if you talk about immigration policies, I'm talking about it. Especially as economists, so economists who are constantly harassing the high income people. If you're not letting in the right kind of people, you're not giving them the rights, uh, there's too much uh, undocumented migration, or we tell the Gulf, it's for both the country migration, that's fine, but the mistreating them, no, 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 or no. But equally guilty are the origin countries. Large number of origin countries, their governments approaches, they go, they send them to this great, but I'm not going to do it. Okay? What we say is to maximize the development impact and the benefit of the migrants themselves, whether they're temporary or permanent migrants. The origin, there's a huge responsibility on origin countries. They have to do from consular preparation to preparation for while they're abroad and before they go to education. To you know, when they come back, reintegration to the labor market, all range of policies, but most importantly, migration, immigration has to be part of the overall development agenda. And there are very few factors that are included into this. Not like that, that's it is utterly responsible for the development. 
Now, the destination countries, what we are saying, again, push, how do we push people to that corner, right? The origin countries have to help their migrants, be educated, protect their rights. So they, you force them, do not let them be the undocumented migrants. The destination countries, it boils down to inclusion, giving them rights. We're not saying giving them citizens, giving them rights, basically. This is a replication of some of the work for have done. Look at the, this is controlling for the age of arrival, the education level, all those factors. So all these differences, your legal status. And after you arrive, the wage, this is logarithmic, so the wage growth is pretty the same path, undocumented and documented. But after 10 years, it splits up. Documented migrants cannot keep up with the citizens. Undocumented migrants, because certain career paths are closed, you can never be the manager. Right? You're working at a restaurant, you cannot be the manager. You're working at a construction site, you can never be the foreman. This is this is a logarithmic difference, and it's almost a 50% wage gap. Controlling for everyone. It's it harms the migrants, but it harms you. Right? Because you're not collecting taxes, you're not getting the full benefit of their being taxed. And then plus there's endogenic, remember then they're not gonna invest in the job if they're not gonna get the and the externalities, the one thing that the EJ ignores is it is cost. Migrants in post Ronaldo went to Saudi Arabia, 500 million dollars, they are all in there. The Saudi Arabian uh, fans are ecstatic, but there's one guy who lost his job because of Ronaldo. Right? And that guy. Poor Saudi player who lost his job. <laughs> I mean, migration is at the end of the day is also about distribution. Right? When migrants come, the consumers benefit, co-workers benefit, right? The other team players with one other benefits from that. Consumers, the fans benefit, the management definitely benefits. But there are some losers. So any policy must take that into account. Right? You have to have some sort of adjustment mechanisms for the people who are going to be negatively impacted either in the labor market or in the housing market or in the education market or health care. You know, right? So this is, and this is uh, New York metropolitan area. Right? You see how different it is, the immigration issue. This is the, the heterogeneity that has come and impact. So you, the, the problem with migration, the source of the political opposition, the gains are long term, are heterogeneous, and widespread, un unobservable. Okay, so we have a, a Ethiopian granny who has been with us for over ten years. She was a political refugee. There is no doubt we can have three kids and do careers and so on. Right? But does it really register? Especially with my wife, I this register with me because I work on migration. But with my wife, I don't think it registers. Part of her career success is due to having easy access to household help, right? Whereas the costs of migration are concentrated, immediate, and absorbed, and has to go to the So you have to basically, uh, the, the, you have to kind of figure out ways of compensation and introduce flexibility to the labor market for the major job and uh, can be compensated. But, the main thing you need to deal with is the stress migration. The stress migration happens, let's say, in the US, because we do not, we have huge needs for unskilled labor. The two occupations in the US, the largest share of immigrant workers. In, can anybody guess what they are? One is engineering professors. Okay, over 60%. Right? Talk about skill distribution, right? That, that's there. The second one are food figures. Right? But we don't have formal entry mechanisms. I'm not again talking about citizenship, but we have a zero program where they come and out. Now you have undocumented migration and they're at the mercy of the employer and whatever. Uh, right? It hurts everybody. And they still complement that. So how do we take it back? That's the long term. You don't need to be alternative, but you are academics. Imagine how the world would be if you did not have all the 
the best and the brightest of the world sitting next in the next office in terms of advancing ideas and work. Right. So getting back to the framework, I'm almost finished. We want everybody in that corner. That's the objective of the policy, and that requires increasing legal pathways. Legal pathway, again, doesn't need to be citizenship. It depends on the, the choices of the country. At the end of the day, they have sovereignty. But the worst thing that can happen is basically <coughs> undocumented distressed migration. Okay, it creates resentment, both socially, but it's costly and it's not necessarily beneficial to the rest of the country. And if you work together, take the entry paths and move the entry motion. So, what do we need to do? This group is easy. And it's all the positive impact. It increases the gains. The all the destination packets need to basically be the drug drugs. A lot of undocumented migrants, by the way, are over here. The reason we're eating apples for dollar forty nine pounds is thanks to those fruit because otherwise it'd be four five dollars. You already been. Right? But we want to push them even higher. The problem the distressed migrants, how do we reduce this? Because the pressure for that is going to increase because of all that map I showed you, because of climate change, poverty, fertility, and uh, uh, conflict, it's going to increase these people. Right? I mean, people do not risk their lives if they are desperate, if they're really poor. Okay? What do we need to do first? We need to expand the definition of the coverage of the refugee. There are some people who are literally because of the gangs or cartels or you name it. They're white elephants. It doesn't matter if it's militia, if, whether if it's, it's some uh, criminal cartel that's uh, targeting them. Right? It has to be covered. But the second thing, the destination countries, the high income destination countries, have to expand legal entry paths. But they're coming in a way because there is demand for them. It is very hard to fight the market. Right? The, the politicians have to realize it. And but the big elephant in the room, not all type of mobility, is a good marriage. Okay? It's here. This group, this is not a good match. This group, we have a moral and a legal responsibility. <clears throat> we signed international agreements. This is part of the UN. We can't get out. This part, it's not a legal responsibility, but it's a moral responsibility. And it's an economic actually incentive because they're going to try to come in. When we talk with the Mexican executive director, or the Tunisian executive director, the big thing they want to talk about are not the Tunisians in France or the Mexicans in the US, but the, the, the transit migrants, the Central Americans and the Sub Saharan Africans that are going through their countries to Europe and the US. It is a regional problem. Okay? So the number of people dying, they should, there's no reason why people should be dying on a boat. Okay? The routes, you've seen these are the main routes. And people are very smart. They change routes the moment there is some sort of enforcement. But what we need to do is with the refugees, okay, there, there, there is a big problem with refugees because it's a global public problem. We all want the refugees to be taken care of, but we want our neighbors to take care of them. We want them all to stay in Turkey and we want them to stay in Colombia. That's not going to happen. Either you put money or you take. Okay, this is, this is truly a global public problem that we have to address. And the, the way the UNHCR budget operates is incomprehensible. And I mean, it's just unreal because annual budgets. I mean, how can you have The average refugee status duration is 13 years. 13 years average duration of a refugee status. There are third generation Afghans in Pakistan in refugee camps. Third generation. People have been living there for 45 years. Right. It's um, unacceptable. And then, as I said, for these people, we move here, we move here, but there's still going to be people. And believe it or not, like it or not, some humanitarian deportation has to be part of the process. You're not going to get rid of this unless there's economic development in poor countries. Look at Ireland and Italy. They were the largest migrant sending countries 100 years ago because of poverty. Now they're migrant receiving countries. Right? Things are going to change. Development is the big thing when if you want to get to the Okay, but that's a long-term horizon. It's not the purview of the WDR. What I can say in the context of the WDR is, and 
at the margin of the moon sun here and of the Okay, so wrapping up. We need to make policy differently. Again, the objective is everybody migrates voluntarily because of out of choice and out of basically that everybody green. And uh, to do this, there's a responsibility falling on the developing countries, origin countries, but there's a responsibility, huge responsibility falling on the shoulder of the global community, whether to handle the issue of the refugees. Or how do we handle this migration? Because especially this, this, this migration, right, is endangering the stability of both legal systems here. That's why it took two years. It takes two years to process a refugee application. They're trying to figure out which part of the line, which side of the line you're on. Right? That's basically what it is. Are you a real refugee? Do you, do you really qualify? Or here, people pay seven, eight thousand dollars to priorities. That went across the border and it becomes a political order. You ship them to New York and all that mess. Okay. Uh, and what needs to happen, law and minor countries also have to be part of the discussion, the decision process. I would love to see an OPEC of labor signing countries, for example, to the government. Right? They have to be active there. It's their citizen at the end of the day. And we also have to get a civil society, workers' association. Like, you go to the uh, Department of Homeland Security, there's not a single economist in the room. <coughs> right? There's not a real concern about the economic outcomes of migration. It's all about national security and blah, blah, blah. Right? So, uh, sorry, no offense. <laughs> you know what I mean. I mean we have to say them. Look, <laughs> the 19 out of the 20 largest IT companies are American. There's a reason for it. Okay, I mean, there's absolute there is the whatever 15 out of the top 20 universities in the world are American universities. There's a reason for it. 80 percent of the Nobel Prize winners are in the U.S. and two thirds of them are foreign born. There's a reason for it, despite the policies. Okay, and of course the migrants and refugees have to be part of the decision making process, and. The main message. I mean, I have said almost all of them. Uh, oh, I'm doing great, and nobody. Two minutes. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> the match is the match is strong. The issue is relativistic. Okay. All you need to do is to improve the match. The destination countries. The, the the social and the cultural controversy also has to do with the economic side, right? The the and. Uh, Anti-immigrant sentiment, xenophobia, and stuff increase when the economy broke. There is a reason why fascism rose up right after the Great Depression. And it's the same thing in the US. I came here 35 years ago. There wasn't as much strong anti-immigrant resentment during the Clinton years because the economy was strong. Right? 2008 financial crisis hits, and then it's perfectly parallel. Okay? So we have to focus on the long term. <clears throat> Uh, and it uh, has to do with the rights. We have to let everyone come with certain legal protections. We cannot just let them come. But the, the, when the match is weak, that's where we have the problems. If it's refugees, the costs need to be shared because it's a global public good and we sign an obligation. And then uh, distressed migrants is a problem. The numbers are very small. But it's likely to increase given the current trends, and that's what we need to address. And then, how do we actually do all of this? We just have to listen to economists and democracies <laughs> and not to politicians. All right, so this is the website. And you can even use the, uh, you know, uh, your iPhones, you don't, even if you don't want to type, that's easier. And any questions you might have. Thank you so much.